Hey everyone, Peter here with another imaging tutorial video. Uh, today I just want to talk briefly about saving your image files. This may seem like a fairly straightforward concept or idea, but there's some idiosyncrasies to it, and there's some information that could potentially help you better save your files so that in the future you can uh, draw information from them and get better quantitative or qualitative results from your images. So to begin with, I just want to uh, show you this image that I've acquired. There are three different colors present in this image, and I captured it using just the capture button. The information I'm about to discuss is also relevant if you would use the ND acquisition method of acquiring an image, which is what I would recommend someone do. But if you're coming from a situation where you just wanted to capture a couple images uh, using this button, then you'll be in this situation as well. I have this image and I want to save it and make sure that I save all the information and don't lose anything in that process. So first things first is just hitting the capture button doesn't mean that the image was saved. It just means that it was loaded or acquired in the software. Now the next step is to actually take this image and save all the information, all the metadata and the image itself to your hard drive. So to do that, there's actually many different ways of doing this, but the first thing I would do is go file and then just save as, uh, because under the save as option is this save as type ND2 image file format, which is the native elements software file format. And basically you can think of this as like a project file that if you were to open it in Elements, uh, or Fiji for that matter, it can also open this file, it retains all of the metadata that it acquired through Elements. So this is absolutely essential if you ever want to do any analysis on your image within Elements or not lose any information uh, after acquiring the data through compression, say, or something to that end. So this should always be your first step. Make sure that the images that you're acquiring are saved as ND2. If you take nothing away from this video, that should be the number one thing is, is acquiring an ND2 image. So I'm just going to call this test and I'm going to save that um, to my, my folder. So I'll just save it there. And now you see all these options are here. You can modify these if you'd like, but typically I'll just say, okay. And now it will save it as an ND2 file and I can just drag and drop it into elements and it'll load it exactly as you see here. The next thing, which is probably what you'll actually be using to show the data to others and to potentially publish that data, is you'll want to save it as a TIFF file. A TIFF file is an uncompressed image file. And uncompressed is important because you won't lose any data in an uncompressed scenario. Whereas for something like a JPEG, you will be taking the image data and compressing it down to a smaller file size, yes, but you're going to lose information in the process. Information that's necessary to have the best looking image while also being able to parse the metadata for quantitative image analysis. So I always recommend to users that they save their files as both ND2 files, like I said, because that's the native project file in Elements, but also as TIFF files. So how to save your files as TIFF files? Well, same thing, we're going to go to File, but now we're going to go to this Save Export to TIFF File. So the first question here is whether you want to store your data into a multi-page TIFF or if you want to split it into multiple files. You can load these multi-page TIFFs in other image software like Fiji, so it doesn't really matter used to be the case that a multi-page TIFF might be difficult to load in image software. It's not really the case anymore. But just to be safe, I usually like to split them into multiple files. The dimensions of the file names are going to be represented by the C value, and it's just going to use the channel names. So that means that down here, it's just going to use 405, 48, 561 as my file names. And all this will become apparent once you actually export and save the file. Uh, so your next uh, set of options here is actually deciding how to export your files. Uh, I usually, this first option here, I usually just keep it checked, which is just to keep your original channel combination of 405, 48, and 561, and then to keep the bit depth. Um, so this is critical. This option right here is going to decide if you're going to compress or pad your data or your images or keep it the same. 
and I always keep the bit depth option. So I'm going to keep this at keep bit depth. You have the option to also include your lookup tables, your LUTs, and you can apply auto LUTs, which will automatically uh, truncate your LUT range so that uh, it will try to approximate what looks the best for your, your channels. You can also use the saved LUTs, which is potentially, uh, like you see in the, the background for this image, I've actually already modified my, my lookup tables. So if I were to do the saved LUTs, it would save this image, basically. It would, it would show you the LUTs that I made, or the modifications I made there. And I'm not going to worry about the safe color channel per pixel. I'm going to move down now to a mono image for each channel. And that just means that it's going to save each one of your images, so 405, 488, 561, as a separate image, and it's going to look gray. It's just, they're all going to be saved as grayscale images. From a microscopy point of view, this is really what you ought to be working with if you're going to be messing around with your images for quantitative analysis or trying to merge those images later on in, say, Fiji to get a better lookup table. In my experience with microscopy data, I always work with mono images where I keep the bit depth and I don't apply any lookup tables. So for best practices for microscopy images, I would make sure you always have this option checked because this will save all of your data as separate files that you can call on later without any image loss. This option, this RGB image, is yet another way of saving the image files um, where you can basically save your images as you see here uh, in the channel color. You can scale these images as well and also apply saved or auto lookup tables. So I usually scale these. These are usually the images that I will take and scale uh, so I can look at them later. And I usually use this kind of option for um, quickly sending this data to collaborators or other users who may want to see an image. And I this way I don't have to load it into Fiji or another image software program and save it as an 8-bit so they can see it natively on their computer. So this option is just for looking. It's not really for publication or anything like that. I also potentially use this for presentations to show your data. You have the option, too, of burning the scale, the binary annotations. Elements, since it's already calibrated for your objective and uh, field of view size, um, this is the easiest way of quickly adding a scale bar to all, all of your images. And burning the scale just means exactly what it says. It adds the scale bar to your image so it's it's a part of the image then it's not some um, external component that you can separate so doing this will permanently add the scale bar to your image and you'll overlay it there so again this is very useful if you just want to quickly disseminate your your images to others and this will automatically give you the scale bar you need that's calibrated for your image objective and an optical component. Finally, there's this all channels merged to an RGB overlay image. This just this is basically what you see here in the background. It's going to save the images as you see the image as you see here where it's it's merged them into a single image and it saves it as an RGB image. This is again another situation where I like to scale to 8 bit so I can just send this image to collaborators say here's what the images look like and I'll usually apply the saved LUTs. So this, this is kind of a good way of disseminating your images uh, collectively into one image so you don't have to send each channel individually. So as you can see, there's a lot of different options here for saving your files, and they all kind of do a little bit different things. I think as long as you take away from this video that first you want to save your files in ND2 file so you can come back here anytime and save the images as you, as you want, and also that if you do end up uh, saving files as TIFF files, I highly recommend always saving a mono image for each channel, uh, just because that's the most segregated and uh, reproducible way of doing quantitative image analysis um, on your images without using the project file. So I'll stop here for this video, but uh, please make sure to check out some of my other tutorial videos, uh, like using optical configurations, uh, making a Z-series experiment, or finding your best imaging settings. If you have any questions or comments, please send me an email at opticalcore at biochem.wisc.edu. And thanks for watching.